Good afternoon, everybody. I am attorney Danielle Patterson, candidate for state rep out here in West Philly, baby. I know we talk about the 190 all the time, but people really don't know where it is. And I can give you a very gerrymandered map, but I'm going to tell you it's Headington and Dunlap, it's Cedar Park, Mill Creek, East Palton, East Parkside. Uh, you know what? We always forget about uh, our Parkside uh, business Association and all the work they do up and down our corridors and the 52nd Street Business Association. Don't forget that we run quite a bit south all the way down and encompass down to Malcolm X Park and all the way up to Sun Avenue and Winfield Heights. We're very close to Penn Memorial tomorrow where they'll be offering free COVID testing and we're going to talk about the Black Doctor Consortium as well. So today we had a little bit of change of plans and so we are bringing back to you uh, Gary Bailey Esquire of Bailey and Associates. Say hi, Gary. Good afternoon, Danielle. Good afternoon, everyone, for uh, tuning in. Hopefully, we can again give you some more information data to help you during this crisis. So, let me tell you what happens. And this is a little bit sad. Um, and also enlightening. So the pastor um, that was supposed to join us today, Dr. Rogers, is actually the pastor, the senior pastor of the church that I regularly attend, Christ the Calvary Covenant Church, which is technically not in the 190. But and if any of you know, just like we had the imam here yesterday, churches don't stop just because of borders. So but they're a small community church and that, you know, about 80 percent of the congregants actually live in the 190, including myself. So uh, it's not just always about location. A lot of times it's about reach and about how you can outreach into the community. But unfortunately, um, if no other businesses these days are thriving, unfortunately, the, the funeral business and uh, the pastoral business is thriving. And that's because um, we have pastors like my like my own Dr. Rogers is really hands on and he makes sure that he reaches out to his congregants. And we had a little bit of a, a scheduling problem because he was traveling to um, check on someone who's ill and had bad reception. And we just didn't want to get started with the in and out reception. So we're going to try him a little bit later in the week as we commit as we continue with our community themed week. Um, but to that end, there are a couple things going on in my mind. I said, you know. I said, what does the community need more than anything um, when we start thinking about life as we know it changing? What do we need? We need lawyers. We, we always need lawyers. And it's a little bit different because now it's time to start getting our houses in order. Big time, Gary. What you think? Um, without question, one of the things I've been trying to um, explain to people is, is this is a time to invest um, and your family, as well as in your your um, your neighbors and your constituents, obviously for you, Danielle, um, and any of your clients, because this is a time where we're all struggling, and you will be remembered for your generosity during this time, um, not how you kind of batten the hatches down and, and just only took care of yourself. So you know, it's kind of like they say on the airplane: make sure you put your mask on first before you help other people. But that's the important part to that statement. So you can help other people. So this is a time to where you have to take care of home. You got to make sure everything is done right. But you got to look to your left and your right and make sure the people next to you are safe too. Well, you know, Gary, that's very, very important. And I appreciate you bringing that up because I really have to give it to, you know, our um, real community-based organizations and not just the organizations. I really got to say, you know, thank you to the people that have been out there in the community because the 190th, uh, especially, it's been thriving because of the community effort. You know, when uh, all the times um, we haven't had people who've been in powerful positions who've reached it back to us and given us that hand up. It's been the folks in the community. It's been the folks, again, you know, I just mentioned, uh, you know, over at the 52nd Street Business Association or, or you know, East Parkside Business Association, you know, thinking about my friend uh, Shir Shirley Randleman and uh, the work that she's done up and down the corridors, now working, trying to get them cleaned up. Because, again, I talked to you guys before, this lack of cleanliness is the definitive outlier of a health and safety issue. We can't be healthy walking around in the midst of garbage. 
you know, it's the folks who are making sure that we have um, adequate care and feeding for our kids right now. You know, I really got to give it out to the Belmont Charter School Unified System there. Uh, Tony Dover and his uh, his staff. Uh, I'm sorry, Well, actually, he's not the principal. He's the counselor. But he's who I've made direct contact with making sure that not just their kids eat, but that kids in that neighborhood eat and to make sure that they're there you know, for them, you know, reaching out to uh, the folks from the um, Winfield Heights Association who made sure that their seniors have been reached out to and cared for. People have been reaching back and providing information. And I'm going to be honest, like only we know how to do. Because, you know, we, we came through the last recession. And I'm talking about folks that look like us. You know, you know, we know how to struggle and come out on the other side, real survivors. We always have and we've all, we've always known how to, to batten down the hatches around one another. You know, and I love that about the black community. It's always been a community. You know, we got what's going on up there in Harrisburg and out there in Michigan and the folks down in, you know, Kentucky and, and Georgia and everybody wants to rally. And you know what? And I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Do you ever notice, Gary, that, um, you know, we, we, we've had our rights trampled on for hundreds of years and we can still have a sense of family and a sense of community and a sense of belonging and a sense of connectedness through all of that. And, you know, these folks didn't even make it 30 days. Did you notice that? Of course. I, well, not only they might make 30 days, I don't think they made 48 hours. No. <laughs> of the country, you know, have they been completely shut down? And when you see the insurrection is going on, I mean, let's call it what it is. It's Trump supporters that are basically using it as a way to kind of throw weight behind, you know, their president um, and what, what he's doing. But here's just a, as a, as a side note, what I found immensely troubling is how in the world did all those Trump supporters get into the Capitol with guns? Well, that's exactly oh, where right. I'm going with the legal lesson because, you know, um, every place has not been an open carry state, but you can't. I mean, they were threatening violence. They, it was they were they were these folks weren't just walking around with their guns. They were walking around with their guns as a mean of inciting actual alleged protections. Right. And your Second Amendment rights and folks get so confused about this and they want to talk about the guns, the guns, just like in down in Virginia. I was like, uh, so I'm, I'm watching the news and I'm so confused because Trump told them to get out there and fight for their Second Amendment rights. I'm like, what does that have to do with being quarantined? Right. I, I mean, and listen, correct me if I'm wrong, unless you're going to, you can shoot bullets at the air droplets. What, what, are, they, what are they protected? I didn't hear um, that the governor deployed the army or the National Guard to lock people in their home. So what, what exactly are they fighting against? I'm, uh, that's but, what I want to know. But wait a minute. Do you know where the National Guard is deployed to lock people in their home? Do you know? Uh, only other than New York and, and um, California. So Puerto Rico. Oh, OK. You know, we forget that we got a whole population yeah. of United States citizens who've been dealing with a crisis that before this one and now are being struck by this one. And the federal government, yeah, they, look, they, the National Guard is right there making sure that, I mean, their curfew is really strict. It's like Italy over there and we're not talking about it at all. Wow. And we're not talking about it at all. You know, yeah. some of my Puerto Rican friends were just like, we don't even know how to get in contact with our family or what to do with our family. You know, it's a whole reign of terror, but we didn't forgot about it. Just like it's, you know, not a part of our country, which is amazing because according to Trump, we got a hundred governors that reached out, hundreds, excuse me, of governors that reached out to him because they wanted the states reopened. Yeah. Hundreds of yeah. governors reached out to them. I guess he's counting um, the whole North America and part of uh, Central and South America, too. Yeah, I, I guess some Mexican governors reached out to him and some yeah. Canadian governors like me. If you just if you're a governor and this is the craziness, you can't even pretend like that's it because um, hmm, they don't have governors in um in those other countries. Yeah, that's exactly. not even what they call them. So. It's just president. And if they have a governing body. But I, but I've been paying attention from the beginning. Um, and it's interesting some of the words he keeps using. So when, when he says this is a war, when he says, you know, get out and protect your rights, um, when he's talking about doing things against the state, I mean, in the most silent way, it seems like he's trying to get as close to initiating 
presidential war powers as possible without there actually being a declaration um, of war. And that's where things get, you know, very murky, but not to, you know, call the boogeyman on anybody. I don't really see it happen because Congress is so far against them. Um, I don't, I don't see where he'd be able to slide it in unless somehow during the summer, the pandemic, you know, mushrooms like four or five times over to where everybody just gets on the United front and kind of lets them run wild. I don't, I don't really see that happening. Well, the sad part here is this, um, is that, you know, Charlotte, Charlotte Greer Brown says it's an up, uprising and that's what it is. It, it's an uprising. It's an uprising. This is, they're, they're like, kind of like, you know, trying to push for a civil war out here and God forbid that some folks that look like us, I mean, you know, Colin Kaepernick that went out there and, and, and kneeled and they ain't got over it yet. Okay. Like, <laughs> they still not over it. He, he kneeled and we both forget that we didn't just see a whole bunch of, you know, and well, this is the thing we did forget. I actually reminded folks that it wasn't a year ago that they were rallying in Virginia and, you know, on a college campus, you know, amongst, African Americans about their rights mm -hmm. and had pitchforks and and torches that, that, along with their weapons. But, I, but I'll say this, Danielle. Um, let it not be uh, not said. Uh, no double negative and all that. But I don't think we're gonna back them up on this one. I, I think we had a reason to during the Civil War. I, I, slavery kind of gave us the motivation to pick up some guns and stand beside them. But in this one, I, I think we're going to leave them to themselves. I don't think they're going to get me up on this one. I think we're going to this one. They're going to be like, oh, that's messed up. Look yeah, I mean, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure what hook they can use to get us to back them up on this one. I, I mean, well, I guess. You know, the interesting thing about it is this. So, you know, I, I'm... I'm a lover of history, uh, mm -hmm. lover of the Constitution. I'm, I'm a lover of the law. We talk about the legislation all the time. But so this is definitely one of those things when you don't like understand history, you're doomed to repeat it. Sure. So, you know, because everybody always thought that, you know, uh, Civil War is really about ending slavery. It was not. It was a byproduct. You know, Lincoln freed the slaves because he needed us to be able to come fight. That's what, it wasn't because we was free. It was because he needed to be able to legitimately, one, to get us engaged in the right. war, and number two, to get us to come fight. Because think about it, y'all. How are you going to free somebody that, when in a state that already doesn't recognize you as the government? Right. So he freed slaves in South Carolina, in Georgia, in Tennessee, in Texas, where they already did not recognize, um, they didn't recognize him as the president. They were all, you know, under Jefferson Davis. They had their own president. Right. So it's ridiculous that they think that this, you know, Confederate flag is like their symbol of their, their rights and their powers, which is actually a symbol of uprising. Right. But the other thing is the reason that that war, they couldn't win it was because they were agricultural and not industrial. Right. And they didn't have seaports that they controlled. They didn't have uh, manufacturing that they controlled. They didn't have the bulk of the population. Does it sound like a familiar scenario? Yeah, and that's and see that I'm glad you brought it up because that's where I try to educate people on what martial law actually is and when it was last done. Because during that time, that's when Lincoln suspended certain constitutional rights so he could block off the um, Atlantic Ocean so that the mm -hmm. South couldn't get in more slaves. They couldn't get in more ships. Because if I recall, and you can correct me because you're the history buff. But wasn't even France or another country helping out the South a little bit in the war? And that's why he blocked. And that's why yeah. Lincoln got yes. the Navy to block off and put in martial law saying, basically, if anybody commits treason, they're going to go to jail and, it, and the Constitution is suspended. You're going to sit until all this is over. You know, it well, wasn't. And Rob, you're correct. Um, technically, the South had more economical strength over the North. Um, so it's it's a little bit different. It wasn't that they had more economical strength. They had traditional economical strength. At that time, we were still an agricultural society. So the South had all the land and all the agriculture, but we were moving towards becoming an industrial industrialist nation. Whereas the North, we, you know, the, the cotton gen had come along and made the slaves um, 
you know, made cotton something that uh, was was not so labor intensive. So they had that. And the uh, North actually owned all that stuff. So they were transporting the cotton because all the railroads were coming out of there. Coal was heavy, steel was heavy, and all that stuff was coming out the North. So the ability to be able to to make the guns and the weapons, uh, the, the, the supply chain, does this all sound familiar? Because we have all these issues with the supply chain right now. Yeah. All those things were not in the South. So as soon as the blockade went up and the means to get it in from somewhere else, what happened? The South fell and they still trying to get that thing to rise again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they still trying to get it to rise again. Yeah. And, you know. Um, and that's been their rally cry since 1865. The South will rise again. But but that's what I'm saying. It's this is this, again. This want to be interesting because I, I, I I mean, listen, we can talk and we can speculate on what would make, you know, African-Americans and Hispanics and Mexicans anybody get involved. But I, I, I'm i not sure what would get us involved in this fight. I, I, I think it would be, it's, you know, they, they'll literally just be going against each other and we'll sit back and watch. I don't, I don't even think in that scenario will be collateral damage because they're not they're not our neighbors right in your district. I mean, my block is a little bit integrated, but it's a different situation. So we're talking about the Appalachian states, right, which is um, Pennsylvania outside of Philly, West Virginia, Virginia, you know, Kentucky, all those places. I mean, if if they're going to uprise, okay, I I guess. Good luck. I don't I don't know. I'm going to tell you, well, you know, again, we're just having a kind of historical conversation because it's the basis of a lot of law right now. Yeah. And that, that was the whole point of talking about all this stuff on the back is that we're really talking about where does these laws then come from? Gary's, you know, explained martial law because that, you know, especially in the hood, we've been talking about, you know, the declaration of martial law um, numerous times. And, you know, Gary's explained, you know, what that difference and significance is. But the Oh, absolutely, um, Rob. Slave, not only was it motivated America's wealth, it was considered America's wealth. Remember, in the South, they were using them to count as two thirds of a person. That way, they didn't have to give them any rights, but could still use them to determine their population in what? The census, so that they could get um, resources to their states. That sounds was, like, sounds was like the prisons. Sounds like the prison system. Yes, it does. And wait a minute, in prisons, we're not even two thirds, we're a whole person. Right. Yeah. So. We're a whole person there when we counting out there in Lackawanna County. We we count in the prison in Lackawanna County. We still a person. Which which is why which is why most of the counties outside of Philly have tremendous amount of wealth if they have prisons because they have people who are completely disenfranchised, can't vote, can't make any political moves, but they count for the purposes of getting tax dollars from Harrisburg. So now, and those are the same folks who are rallying against Hallie Harrisburg. That's who it was. Yeah. That, that's exactly, you know, who it was. So now where are we with the law? And that was the whole point of, you know, the background of um, uh, legal lessons for life today. So we're here and now we're wondering, you know, OK, so we're so worried about our rights. Are our rights being trampled on? And that's what I wanted to talk to Gary about today, because they're not yet but we've got some real changes that are going on in the law and we're not paying attention. So I'm going to start with um, the laws on nursing homes, hospitals, medical negligence and workers' compensation. So that's a lot, but it kind of all goes together because they steady trying to trying to there's a lobby out there that's trying to mark it all together to protect. So while we are worried about whether or not our nurses and doctors have proper uh, the PPE that they need to be able to take care of folks. Instead of the lobby, making sure that they can get that supply chain together and get PPE for their folks. What are they lobbying in Harrisburg? Do you do even know about this song, Gary? Because the whole no, No, I I mean, I've been paying attention off and on, which is essentially um, what. And and I, you know, I was talking to a couple of colleagues, um, a couple of weeks ago, one of the reasons when you look at why they're knocking everything down as a COVID death is because that's going to essentially wipe out a lot of claims when it comes for, you know, malpractice, mm-hmm. wrong death, 
workers comp etc um because otherwise it'd be it'd be no reason not to make sure you have uh full transparency on how these you know sicknesses and deaths occur for the simple fact yeah. that you're putting them all on one type of death pretty much putting them in a body bag and locking them in the trailer outside i mean the writing is clear on the wall what they're trying to do they're trying to protect all of these businesses and listen the other part too is sometimes we forget who's at the top of the, the totem pole the top of the pole, totem pole in american capitalism are banks and insurance companies so uh we may want to look at you know so-and-so nursing home as the bad person or so-and-so doctor it's really not them it's the insurance company and it's the banks because at the end of the day when we get to make these lawsuits against these big corporations it's the insurance company who's making uh multi-billions you know and this is individual their whole business as itself is worth trillions um they're making infinite amounts of money on policy premiums and one of the lies that's out there is that somehow lawsuits and claims affect their bottom line it doesn't lawsuits and claims um affect less than i think is 20 percent of their profit which is basically insignificant um, so it's important that we pay attention and we watch out for some of these laws that they're trying to sneak past because essentially we're going to have a two, three year period to where um, the insurance company is going to have windfall profit in these nursing homes. Um, and even, you know, I, I hate to say it, but some of the hospitals and doctors are going to walk with a certain amount of immunity, um, not for people like myself and Danielle, and some of the other younger, healthy people, but for our parents and our grandparents if they're still living. They are going I'm to be the damage. Yes. And I'm going to just jump in here because Nicole actually asked a question, which right. is where this is going. Yeah. Please discuss how the immunity laws will play out, play out post COVID-19. So that's the problem, um, Nicole, is that the actual law that was lobbied for in Harrisburg, and I just want you to know that it narrowly lost because don't forget in Harrisburg, we have a Republican majority still. Don't forget that. Um, and again, our governor, Governor Wolf, really had to, you know, and he's had to really step out and step up for the people a lot lately. So the broad, the law was so broad based that everything that was named a COVID death would give them immunity. Well, this is the problem that we still have to do antibody testing. We still we don't know how long we're going to have COVID in our systems. So right. it's kind of like I tried to explain before when we talk about like the mesothelioma mesio, death. Mesothelioma. I can't. What's we'll that word? Okay, so mesothelioma. Thank you. <laughs> mesothelioma deaths from cancer that they weren't able to get a causation. What's going to happen is everything's going to be COVID related. So I'm going to give you uh, an example from my own life because I've since I've talked about it. I've to told you before that my, my mother actually contracted swine flu and went to the hospital and was in, you know, an infectious disease ward and all those things. And that while she was there, a few days later, my father died from swine flu. When my mother came out of the hospital, she was cleared. And she had and she came out of the hospital with end stage renal failure. The end stage renal failure causation, as we were trying to get all of her stuff worked out so she could have. Uh, medications and so that you know before she ended up on dialysis she did end up on dialysis eventually it became well it was related to swine flu and so it became that everything was related to swine flu so we didn't cover this and we didn't cover that and like her long-term care insurance disability policy that she had had forever we had to sue about because immediately the policy was null and voided because it was not related to the fact that she was now 68 it was related to the fact that you had uh swine flu you know seven years ago and so now we don't know what it's related to and we're going to say that we're not going to cover you for long-term disability. So that means you just need to retire if you want a benefits package. That's how that immunity plays out, which the reason that you have to, and we understand, okay? I don't think, and I need y'all to know this. Um, and I think I, I do more on uh, medical negligence than Gary does. Medical negligence and nursing home are pretty much like kind of, and, and products liability. So big pharma cases, those are really my, my bread and butter. Gary and I actually do a lot of cases together. We've been working together for a very long time. Um, but that's kind of like where I made my niche and I totally accidentally made it. OK, but the rest of that is this. Don't let them fool you into thinking that we're running doctors out of the state with these claims. Even in Philadelphia, 
there are only about 300 medical negligence claims, you know, filed a year. That's nothing. Okay. When you think about the thousands of claims that are filed in Philadelphia, three, three to 500 is really nothing. You know, that's tip of the iceberg. And to say that uh, we don't believe that nurses are, are going out and, and being grossly negligent to folks. If anything, in actuality, and I'll even tell you just personally in the cases that I've seen, when you look at the extra reports, what you get is the nurses end up practicing outside of their scope because they're being forced to, because the doctors are not around, the hospital's not staffed the way it's supposed to, they got too many patients. So what happens is there's, you know, there's a um, an LPN that's doing an orange job. That happens a lot. As a matter of fact, this is the same in our nursing home, in our nursing homes. I keep telling y'all, instead of staffing them properly the way they need to be in the ratios they need to be, they'll take the ding on their um, survey reporting, fix it so that they, because all you got to do is fix the survey and then they're good for another year and then go right back to being understaffed. So it's problematic. So it's not that we think that there are folks out there that are just acting grossly negligent. I don't, you know, I mean, I've had cases where surgeons have, you know, taken off the long, wrong limb and, and operated on the wrong kidney. Yes, I have had those cases. I have. But those those are different. And that raises something that we call gross negligence. That's not just a medical negligence case. But what they're saying is the hospitals get com complete immunity from all of those cases. But even then, and I'm going to say this because I know I see some healthcare workers on here. This, they're also using this to limit what you can get workers' compensation for. So, how you can be able to protect yourself, they're already not giving you the proper PPE. They're already um, understaffing the hospitals. You're already overworked, which means that we know more mistakes will be made. So now this, so now they, they've got you out here risking your safety. And, and I'm going to tell you, I applauded those healthcare workers. There were uh, nurses out there galore who stood up to the protesters and were like, look, protect me. I'm trying to save your life. Go home. You know, so to say that, that now you won't be able to collect workers' compensation to say that in five years we find out something else happened to you because you were a COVID nurse or or and don't forget folks it's not just folks that are nurses it's the administrative support the folks who are having the initial contact when you come into the ER it's the folks it's the folks in the pharmacy or who are filling them scripts to keep you safe it's the technicians that are taking you on and putting you off the vent who have to clean those vents and there are a whole bunch of people that are healthcare workers. Let's not forget it. There are so many folks. And to say that now, based on new law, you're going to be immune, your employer is going to be immune. That's not about you and that's not about me. That's about the insurance company that plays those workers' compensation claims. So so one of the things we should we should let everyone know too is um, this is the perfect time to look into supplemental companies like Aflac, okay? Um, a lot of times we see the commercial and we kind of like laugh and joke and say, oh, what is this? Or it's a gimmick. No, they're called supplemental insurance companies to where they cover things and they pay you money um, for areas or gaps in insurance company, insurance coverage that you're not necessarily aware of, you know, when you just sign up for insurance comp at your um, uh, company. So make sure you start looking into companies like Affleck and et cetera, because it's actually not that much money because the truth is it never really comes into play. But right exactly. now, hey, right now, while stuff is still murky and if you get under one of their contracts, they would have to honor it. This is a good time. And uh, I mean, we're talking literally like, I think, 10, $12 a month, something that's really, you know, it's significant, but it's we're talking a uh, couple of hundred dollars a year for what may amount to tens of thousands of lost income or lost medical coverage um, if you don't have it. So my best, you know, and it's just a guess um, and you can certainly hold me to it. But I, based on how the way the law moves when we're talking about immunities and areas, you know, that are murky, um, there's a real good chance that um, if, again, the federal government doesn't pass it, at least individual states will pass two to four year immunity periods. They're going to give themselves more than enough time for all of this dust to clear, yeah. kind of let people get in and kind of start suing and getting money. They're going to take as much time to, to, to wait. So so whenever, you know, day one of all these lockdowns in, think about from two to four years after that is going to be these lockout periods to where you know, they're going to have a lot of ways to, to keep you out of the court system. And the only thing you could do is try to find other ways 
one to protect yourself with that supplemental but then two you know as we were talking about um last week is cover yourself if you're going to go to an employer make sure okay if they don't give you ppe or anything like that to cover yourself and you still have to go to work make sure they acknowledge in writing that you requested and they denied it okay so that you can have that um you know i would even go so far as to ask them do you know if anyone here in my you know floor or in this cubicle area um you know has tested positive okay because again you want to have everything on your on your side so if you have an unscrupulous you know um, employer that's where you may get some relief but you know mistakes are going to happen we're certainly not going to give information that you know punishes you know mistakes through no fault uh, of anyone's own but what we really have to do is make sure that you all are protected in scenarios that are hot boxes that are toxic or if you're dealing with employers that mm -hmm. are putting you out on a limb with no you know life preserver or, or no hook you know and I want to jump in here. Roger said, but isn't workers comp taken out of our check? So I feel like I need to explain workers comp to you. And it's because that's a yes and a no. Workers comp is taken out of your check, but at a very small percentage. Now you've seen you've seen your your workers compensation bill. The employers pay uh, 85 percent, I think it is, of your workers compensation bill. But their percentage of workers compensation that they have to pay, like your rate, is based on your industry and your likelihood of actually having to use workers comp. That's actually how they get quoted. So example, um, example, Gary and I are lawyers. The likelihood that somebody would have to pay either one of us workers comp is slim to none. There's, there's very little that could happen to Gary or I that would be a workers comp claim. I mean, theoretically, I could walk down the hall, trip on the carpet, fall and break my leg. OK. And you want to know the rest of that is workers comp. I can fall and break my leg and I can still come to work because I have a, a certain kind of job. Healthcare workers like because since we're talking about healthcare workers, I can I can track COVID-19. I can't come to work anymore. Right. Okay? And so therefore, or, you know, I injure myself. I'm a laborer and I injure myself. I can't swing a hammer. I'm an electrician. I, you know, I have a, I have a, an eyesight problem. I, you know, I can't, you know, work on uh, electricity and, and damage myself. The likelihood that something else is going to happen to me is very great. So that means that the cost for coverage for that em employee is that much higher. So this is the thing. They want as few workers compensation claims as possible because the 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 employer doesn't want the base rate per employee to go up. That's a cost of their doing business. So they want to keep the cost low. Now, that also rolls into Nicole actually had a question, which is here. And she says that well, she had a statement that, yes, very sad. Healthcare workers who contract COVID are not allowed to file for unemployment. They are being pushed to pay sick leave and work comp. If they are cut off from or sent in circles with work comp, then it's shameful. So this is what happens. If I'm at work, anything that happens when I'm at work, you cannot collect unemployment. Gary and I explained this to you kind of before. If you're sick, the very first question on unemployment compensation claims are, Gary? Are you available to work? So therefore, if you are not because you are sick from COVID, that means that you can't have it. Now, it's a little different because specifically the new law under the CARES Act says that you actually can cover, you can actually get unemployment under um, CARES Act. However, and this is where it's kind of sad, is this. In many cases, because of the supplement um, from the government, uh, folks, the max you could get is eleven hundred dollars a week. That's the max um, on COVID. So because we max out at five sixty in uh, Pennsylvania and then add six hundred dollars. So six hundred and sixty dollars a week is what you could collect if you were on unemployment. But those are that's a different federal pot. That's a federal pot of federal money. If I'm a healthcare worker, then I am going to have to get workers comp because I was injured on the job. That's an injury on the job. Why would they want you to take workers comp and not unemployment compensation? Because now that's not a drain on all of us. That's a drain right back to what were you talking about in the beginning there, Gary? And insurance companies and employers. 
Yeah, so you did you see the circle? I hope you see the circle, Nicole. And so that is the reason that we're here trying to give you these lessons so you know what to look for and how to continue to protect yourself and your family. That you know, now the rest of that is let's say you're a healthcare worker and you get COVID-19 and you're out on workers comp and you get so sick, somebody has to come out and take care of you. Uh, you know, you somebody has to take care of you, take care of your affairs. Well, under the CARES Act that person is actually covered unemployment now. Uh -huh. So uh, at the same thing, up to $1,100 a week. And don't forget, that's the other thing. I keep trying to explain to people. Everybody doesn't get $1,100, okay? So, because people are like, well, you can make more money. No, you can't. If you're somebody who makes, you know, $400 a week, you're going to make $400 a week. If you are someone who makes $800 a week, then you're going to max out at the 560 from the state. And then you're going to get another two hundred and forty dollars and help you get to eight hundred. If you're somebody who makes five thousand dollars a week, you're only going to get a thousand dollars a week. So it's not a windfall. It's for the first time. They're really trying to at least make people at a higher income whole. So mm -hmm. before unemployment was designed so that somebody making about thirty four thousand dollars would get 60 percent of their pay. And as I said before, the problem with that is 60 percent of your pay was is supposed to also cover your health insurance. And that's never happening. We all know that. The other thing is that the um, the CARES Act still doesn't let you immediately apply for Obamacare. So did you know, I thought that was ridiculous because Trump had just determined he's not going to make Obamacare the, the answer. So as a result, that thing that most people would be able to rely upon, they still were outside of the uh, the cycle period to be able to get Obamacare. So yeah. they, they still don't have that in. So I, we wanted you to understand that. Let me, I have another question. Yes, that's exactly right, Nicole. So that's basically what we're saying. A positive COVID immunity test is, pre, is a pre-existing condition that will have a multitude of consequences going forward yeah. and going forward for years. Yeah. That's basically what we're telling you there. And and that's where, you know, where we just have to be aware and we have to follow how that's going to play into um, tying into vaccinations. Because what I keep trying to tell people is, we're not under a draconian, you know, Julius Caesar. They're not going to force us to do anything. They will make it very difficult by ways of law and finance, right? So as Nicole pointed out to where now on your record says you have a pre-existing COVID test. Now, on the one hand, because you have the antibodies, you may not get it again. It may not matter, right? But for the purposes of getting health insurance, getting a waiver, maybe even getting a job, they may say, oh, well, if you get the vaccine, then you'll be fine will basically take that off your record. So Did pay attention you know, to that relationship and how they're going to use that against people. Now, I learned something that I didn't know is that now um, employers on your uh, initial paperwork are asking whether or not you have diabetes or cancer, that you have these pre-existing conditions. I did not yeah, know. I can see that. Somebody, I think somebody's going to challenge that and, and it can go either way because, you know, they're asking that as a way to see if you're at risk for getting COVID and then actually, I guess at, at the end of the day dying. So I understand why, why a good employer may want to know, but at the same time, it's overreaching. Like, cause at that point, what it, it doesn't matter at that. Cause they're not going to ask if I have asthma. Right. So why are you asking if I have a hypertension or diabetes? And even if I do, so what, what if I'm 150 pounds, perfect health, but I have, you know, juvenile diabetes or something like that. What if I have hypertension? Cause it runs like, it's just too overreaching, and I and I think it should get struck down. But those are one of the things that it's going to lurk around in the community for about a year or two until it makes it up, you know, to the state supreme court and then the U.S. Supreme Court. Like people are going to use that. You know how we say here in, Dan in Pennsylvania, and Danielle, they're going to use it to block the box, right? So check on this box, you're blocked out, mm -hmm. and they're going to use it for a way to fire people. And then remember we talking about a couple, you know, last week yeah. where. You're going to be stuck in a position where you're going to have to be honest with your employer because they're going to have those applications on the side. Right. And then six months from now, you come in uh, work five minutes late or they see you coughing and they want to fire you. They're going to say, oh, well, you lied on your application because you didn't say you had this in your history. And that situation where we're not going to have protection from it for the next year or two. So you really got to be careful about how you're answering these questions. And, you know, ultimately how some of these new laws are going to affect HIPAA and how you get health care moving forward. It's, it's going to be a mess. It's going to be a mess. 
Well, we spend all our time, like, you know, a lot of it these days, because of course it's the crisis of the moment. But a couple things, this was really about you all. So please make sure that you are asking your questions, just that folks have in, you know asked of you. Because uh, I'm going to say, how many times do you get lawyers coming to give you free advice? Because I mean, between Gary and me, this is probably $1,500 an hour worth of uh, talking at you. So so I think you all should, um, actually between the two of us, probably about $3,000 worth of time talking to you. So I'm the point here is, that you need to make sure that you're making the best of it and that you're asking all the questions you can ask because as always what i tell you here at danielle patterson for the 190 when we don't know we make sure we find out because you see me and gary you've been like did you know this did you know that because now you know what lawyers do when lawyers sit around yes for fun we sit around and talk about you know the birthplace of the nation uh what happened with the civil war uh what the war on the dependence really was this is this is, this is we're, we're pretty boring okay this is but we think we think we're so exciting but i'm sure you guys would think so this is really cocktail conversation but that's what it is so please ask our questions now the next thing is i need to talk to y'all because i have seen so much death yeah lately. You know, and now let me tell you, this is probably harder for me um, than um, other folks. So to say that I've seen a lot of death and that it's impacting me because I've seen a lot of death, uh, you know, again, two thirds of my, my clients are estates, meaning that the, the individual who actually suffered the injury is deceased. So. I'm kind of, it's really sad. Back when I was, you know, my brief stint at the DA's office, I was actually assigned to the morgue unit because none of that stuff bothered me. I'd be in the morgue at the, uh, you know, at the autopsy like, oh, yeah, for real, let me drink this. Oh, so what is this, the brain weigh how much? You know, meanwhile, my co my co coworker is over in the corner, you know, earling her brains out because I, but I'm just like, that stuff has always fascinated me. So I, I you know, I'm the niece that's going to come and go, what's that on your back? That is definitely me. Okay. So, I've seen this and we're not ready because we have not handled our business. And I got to talk to you about handling your business. Um, when we started talking about, you know, uh, COVID-19, this is a real conversation that me and Gary had because Gary and I are both in the same situation. We are unmarried with children, both of us. So yes, ladies, the single fella here. Yes, we got a nice handsome attorney dude. And he looked good when he ain't, you know, uh, when he's not in his COVID gear. He, when he's not looking like the Rona. <laughs> Just saying, you know, I always got to find the eligible bachelor out there, you know, close to the end of 190 seconds. So it ain't far. Y'all can get to it. There you go. <laughs> but anyway, um, is this. And so it's a real question. Like, you know, Gary, something happened to you. So what are we going to do? You know, now, fortunately, Gary still has his parents. Um, but at the same time, have you had the conversation with your mom? Have I had a conversation? Uh, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, listen, both of my parents, I'm fortunate. Both of my parents have insurance. I have insurance. Um, I'm my father's only child, so I naturally handle all of his stuff. And my mother um, has set me up to handle everything. So we, we are fortunate in that regards to, to have everything um set up but you know we we are the exception not the rule most of the people most of the friends and family still think that talking about a will or a power of attorney is somehow you know evil talk um and as mm -hmm. you know danielle more often than not we have people coming to us to get power of attorneys when somebody's already in the hospital knocking on death's door which is almost impossible because you run into the issue of are they competent even to sign a document um it's much easier to do now. And, and the other thing, if everyone is listening, understand that you can always change a will, power of attorney, you can always revoke. And realistically, it doesn't even go, and we can set it up that it doesn't even go into play unless you are incapacitated and can't handle your own affairs. Mm -hmm. So one of the misnomers is people say, well, I don't want to get somebody power of attorney. They can sell my house, go on my bank account and all that. Well, there's some truth to that. Yes, if you give it to a thief, they can steal everything from under you. But if you give it to someone who you can trust, then they're pretty much powerless as long as you're around talking to the bank, paying your bills, going to work. People know who you are, right? If they know Miss Smith is going to work every day, paying her bills, mm -hmm. while paying her car, 
when John Smith pops up, they're going to be like, well, no, where's Miss Smith? Like it, it doesn't have these things don't happen in the vacuum, but you got to have it in place to protect yourself, especially at a time like this, because it's it's insanity. The amount um, like Danielle said of death and destruction that's going on and people, you know, you never expect it. So you just have to do it because rather you have these protections in place and never need them as opposed to trying to scramble to get them after the fact. It's, it's just a mess. Yeah. So, you know, I have um, a very different, you know, situation. I have been so honest with you all about, you know, my my family di dynamic and things. So, you know, um, my mother was a second wife and I'm an only child of that marriage. I don't have any biological brothers and sisters um, for my mother. I have my foster brother who's always lived with us. My father, my oldest sister is deceased. So my younger sister is still with us. Well, if something were to happen to me and I didn't get my affairs in order, my little brother would be out on the street. That's what happened. He wouldn't, he wouldn't because he's not my brother. And it, so as a result, you know, I had to think about those things. I don't have any children. It's not automatically going to go to kids. My, you know, both of my parents are deceased, as I told you. So it doesn't automatically go there. So now, so so remember, I, we explained before, it goes first is um, vertical, then it's horizontal. So it goes to your children first. If not your children, then your parents. If not your parents, then you, and you don't have any kids, you don't have any mom, any, any parents, then it goes horizontally to your siblings. So, and they are only the your siblings by blood. So as a result, that means that again, I could theoretically ask somebody not, not, you know, that doesn't have any place to live. That as I told you, he, he took care of my mom and dad like they were his, literally. Like we, as as my mother used to say, she take he takes care of me like he came down the same shoot you did. That's what she always said. Yes, I'm my mother was very colorful. <laughs> came down the same shoot. As a result, I got to make sure I'm protecting him because my parents will want him to be protected. And so I had to write a will, like, you know, for me. And and that was a thing. And people go, oh, do you know how many lawyers I know without a will? Yeah. Y'all you know, know? Because I'm going to tell you, we're always the worst, okay? The people who had the most knowledge are the folks who they're like, yeah, I'm going to get to it tomorrow. <laughs> you know that. It's kind of like when they say contractors' houses always look like they're about to fall in because they answer is, I'm going to get to that tomorrow. Let me go where I can make money. So I'm going to come do your will and didn't do mine. But then I had to start thinking, just like I would tell any of my clients, you know, in what kind of state would I want to be in the hospital? At what point do I want to stop receiving treatment? What kind of treatments do I want? Because all of these things are about getting your affairs in order. Other things I had to start thinking about, you know, I have a business. Gary has the business. Your business needs a beneficiary. Mm -hmm. Who's going to step in and take care of your, you know, your business business, not just your personal business, you know, under what circumstances, who's going to get my cases, who's going to, you know, who's going to be responsible for my firm. So these are all the things that all of you need to think about. I know I got small business owners who are on my feet right now. Something happens to you. Now what? And y'all know if we don't have no other business that we know, everybody had an uncle that owned a bar. Okay. I'm gonna just give y'all the hood stuff. Cause and I'm just look, I try, I try to make it relevant to the stuff that we know, okay? Because um, Arlene, we're gonna come to that. No, a lawyer to create a will. Is that okay? Y'all know we all know somebody that owned a bar, right? And and this happened all the time. So, you know, um, you know, Uncle Johnny owned a bar and you know, Aunt Bernice worked there your whole life. And then Uncle Johnny died and Aunt Bernice get put out of the house and the bar because we found out that Uncle Johnny was married to Aunt June, who you never even met, okay? Uh, and the names have been changed, but this is my family. <laughs> that you, you know, that you never even met. And now, you know, you, you 15 and you over there confused because now the name on the bar didn't change. And Aunt June got a bar with, you know, her kids that you ain't never seen before working there. And, you know, and and and, uh, and Bernice don't have nowhere to go. So, again, we got to we got to be honest about where our money is, because, you know, we got money. I'm tell you, my nana died and it was she got sick. She got really sick one day and I was in the hospitals in the hospital. He said, Pooh, 
I want you to go and knock three times on the bedroom door on the, the second bedroom in the back closer to the back. I was like, what? And child, if a mo- why the money ain't fall on my head? <laughs> I was like, you do what? It was like, knock on the wall and, it's, and make sure you, I was like, okay, they really doing this out here? So yes, they're really doing this. Somebody else, because think about it, she hadn't told me and that was not, that was not, thankfully she she was, you know, another 15 years after that, but had something really happened to her, like, and she hadn't told me, wouldn't have nobody known to knock three, three, seriously, it took three times. And I was like, why three times? Because she had it so that it was situated on the, um, like the ledge where she had had the little compartment made that the third knock made it fall. So it was like, it was open, but the third knock actually made it fall. So it was like, okay, so I guess you could have, you could, you could bang into the, to the, to the wall, the sheetrock and nothing would happen. But if you hit it hard enough, it would, I don't know the craziness, but somebody needs to know where your stuff is. Somebody needs to know where your paperwork is. Um, you know, my father never saw an insurance policy that he didn't like. Apparently, he was that person that, you know, back when they used to come and sell the insurance at the house, my dad must sign up for every insurance policy. It was insurance policies everywhere, okay? And so much so that we had to go through his bank accounts to figure out who all he was paying because they were all, you know, direct the direct payments, authorized with payments because we thought we had the policies and we didn't. It was like four more. And they weren't huge policies, but, you know, but they were policies. So it was money that we could have left on the table, not knowing it was there. So somebody needs to know where your bank accounts are. Somebody needs to know where your financial records are. Somebody needs to know who, who it is that you've trusted with your information. You know, um, the question here was, is a lawyer to create a will? So this is what I'm going to tell you, Arlene. I don't know. You want to answer that one, Gary? Is a, do, you, do you need a lawyer to create a will? Well, you know what I'm going to say. If it's a legal document, you need a lawyer. Um but you know, I'm also honest too, which is your will is just your thoughts, right? And the, in, in the most um, easy sense, you could put your thoughts down on a piece of paper, sign it, and have it witnessed, um, and that would count. But we're not encouraging people to do that. You know, wills don't cost a lot of money. The, the expense comes in what are you trying to protect? So if you don't have a bunch of bank accounts, if you don't have a bunch of disposable property, you know, like clothes, jewelry, you know, paintings, furniture, stuff like that, then a will doesn't become, you know, that particularly difficult. You know, most people over the years that I've done wills for, especially because I volunteer a lot with a couple Mm -hmm. of clinics, usually just have a home, right? And maybe a few household items. Um, but you know, insurance, you can name a beneficiary bank accounts. You can name a beneficiary. If you have a car, you might want to put that. But I want to back up because there are shady banks. And I'm going to tell you right now, Wells Fargo will not honor unless you raise an estate. And that's actually, there's been lots of litigation against Wells Fargo. I don't, I don't even know how Wells Fargo still exists. They always in trouble, Jack. (laughs) <laughs> they all and and I mean those are the folks Wells Fargo that's who was opening up the fraudulent loans mm-hmm. uh, the, the fraudulent bank accounts mm-hmm. that's who was doing the um fraudulent mortgages that's who was do- doing the um the race discrimination or hiring practices and the redlining and then somebody gave them SBA money and what did they do gave it all out to the businesses that didn't need it uh meanwhile <laughs> everybody else out like- warehouse greatest greatest heist um ever with this sba stuff that all of these banks just went and gave out to their big corporate clients i mean if this ain't if this is not the biggest smack in our face and that's why i said listen i don't if 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 the if the nation turns i don't think we have a dog in the fight unless some of these guys in the mountains said they got our loan money now if they got our loan money i'm i'm gonna suit up I'm so, just, well, they, know, they, well, I don't know. I'm, I, y'all know. But they got to give it to me first. I'm not falling for 1865 after the fact. I need my loan money up front, and then I'm going to suit up. You, I'm not no 40 acres in the mule part two. Give me mine up front. Well, now, I don't know, Gary. I'm going to tell you, because I really thought about building the wall when they said they were going to give a student loan. I thought about it. You could work off your student loan. Or did they even say, what is it? And, and uh, they were like, did you go to jail for a year? And get all your student loan debt wiped out. I was like, I know, right? Sound crazy. I, I, I was, George Hill ain't that bad. I was like, mm. well, yeah, ain't that bad. I'll read a couple books, get another degree. 
You know, wait a minute. I, and I would probably wait a minute before I did it. I would probably go. I would go become Dr. Dr. Daniel Patterson Esquire. Right. Like I would just right. I would go be a medical doctor and then go. Like yeah. I'm going to just owe y'all three quarters of a million. Here I come. Like, I don't know. Because I mean, it's just like I tell anybody uh, when, when when I see um, folks who go to jail for stealing small sums of money. I'm like, you get the same time for stealing right. 50 million as you do right. Right. 10,000. So yeah. You know, hmm, I don't know, but um, Roger has a question, and I want y'all to know I'm laughing and joking. Now, that's not the truth, you know, because you know, <laughs> sitting here talking to my friend, sometimes I got to make sure that y'all know I'm joking. Get a disclaimer. Is there a default will? What happens to your property if you die without a will, Gary? Oh, yeah. well, actually, no, he specifically said the question is for you, Miss Patterson. I'm sorry, so <laughs> I'm, here, I'm sorry, it's that, that's right. He don't want to hear from you, Ron, mm -hmm. Gary. I told the ladies you were single, and now he don't like you. But anyway, <laughs> um, so no, so there are um, laws of intestacy, Roger. So the law says, and that's why I was explaining on where your stuff goes. So let's say you have uh, $250,000 in assets, meaning your, your car, your house, and your bank accounts, assets, not your insurance policies. The law says that anything over and you're married, okay? So, and you had some kids and they're not minors, they're grown, you can, your kids are grown. So if your kids are, and grown is over 18, the state of Pennsylvania. So if your kids are over 18, in that situation, your wife would take the first uh, $20,000 plus 60% of the estate, okay? So this is important because that's the reason I picked that amount of money. If you don't have that much money, then your wife takes um, the aggregate sum of the amount of money and your grown kids will be entitled to what's left over because your grown kids are still benefit are still heirs to you. Okay. Now where it gets murky and this becomes a thing is if you have minor children, because then your children are entitled to some of the monies that it would be for them to have, for you to have taken care of them. So there's a whole confusion. So example, but the biggest one that typically comes in, in again, we talk about us because, again, we back to um, Uncle Johnny and Aunt Bernice and Aunt June. So I'm going to say how that, okay, is this. So we're going back to the Uncle Johnny, Aunt June, and Aunt Bertha uh, discussion. So Uncle Johnny has this bar and didn't have any kids. He was married previously to Aunt June, who you don't know, who ain't been around in 25 years. Aunt June is still going to take because there are no kids. She's going to take it all, okay, by law. And then the tax rate on it is like 35% now, Gary. Is that you know the tax part better than me? I just know that the, the outside laws on whatever. okay. I the, the tax rate is 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 I think it's like 35% on intestacy over a certain dollar. And this is the thing, it's all dependent upon the dollar. So they would have to tell you that at the register of wills. But the point here is you don't want to do that. You can protect your assets and you can plan for it. Right. So example, one of the things that I do is I try to advise my clients um, to put their houses into trust. So after a certain, you know, they're, oh, after they get to 60, put your house into a trust. So let's say, Roger, your dad has a house and, you know, it's, um, you know, he's over 60. And why do I say put it into a trust? Because there's a seven year now look back period if you have to go into a nursing home. So let's say, you, you know, your dad breaks his hip and has to go into a rehab facility and then they find a clocked artery and then he got to have heart surgery. All of the, and he's still in the rehab facility. Well, the first thing that the rehab center is going to do is they're going to now force that vesture of his assets. They want the house. But if the house is in trust to you, Roger, that means that dad is only entitled to income from the house, not the actual house. So, the, so that it is a protected asset. And those are the things that you need lawyers for. Absolutely. Because you'll never figure that out. Yeah, right. And I've seen and don't think you're going to do it, Roger, because I've seen folks swear they're making wills and they're making trust and that stuff is not flying in court. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Roger. Okay, so Nicole is back and she says, please discuss how the insurance policy can default into your estate. Well, I, I think that question is we got to switch it. When you have an insurance policy, 
90, I would say 99% of the people are going to name a beneficiary. It's one of the things that they're going to ask you a thousand times over. So it won't default into your state. You can name your state as the beneficiary of the policy. Um, Daniel, I don't know how you feel about it, but I normally tell people if you have the money that you want it to go to someone, not a child, but an adult, name them as the beneficiary because that um, circumvents um, inheritance tax. If you put oh, it, if you put that, if you name your estate, there's some different protections. But then once people take money from it, if it's, it's not the right thing, now they're getting income and they're paying taxes on it. So there's no default. The default is whoever you name as a beneficiary. Um, but you should name, you know, somebody who you want the money to go to. If it's a child, there's some different things that you may want to work out. But if it's an adult, put their name on it. And if you don't have anybody, you can put my name on it so that it doesn't default to your estate. Oh, and the other thing is, and I try to tell people this, okay? So there are all these memes on Facebook about, you know, at 18, you know, I, I, I had a child at 20 and I bought a house for the child and that instead, then I put an LLC in their name and I established credit for them and I did this and that. And then at 18, she had a house and she had, she was able to, she had credit and she, had, this is a lie. Just cause it's in a meme does not make it true. Okay. There are a whole bunch of caveats about that. And let me just explain the most basic. A child cannot make a contract period. So you may, Gary may own a, own a house that he intends to go to his child, but it's Gary's house. And until that child is 18, that house is still Gary's house. Even if he makes a trust, you know, he puts the house into a trust for Gary's kid. Gary still can decide he's going to revoke the trust at any time. So it's still Gary's house. An LLC is a binding contract. It's a business contract. You can't start a business in a child's name. I don't care how many social security card numbers you have. And if you do, it's fraud. Why? Because the child is not 18. And in order to have an LLC and corporation papers, there are articles that have to be registered with the state. So you are registering a fraudulent document. So I just need y'all to know this because I get tired of this meme all the time floating around the hood. And then folks think, oh, I'm giving my child a head up and this and that. And the other thing. And then, oh, and I established child with my credit in my child's name. How about this? Don't mess up the credit in your child's name. At 18, they go and they get a little secure car. And in six months, they got 850 credit score. That's all. It's not that hard. It's really not. It's not that hard. You do not need to have 25 years of reporting a gas bill to go get a credit card. If anything, typically you got 25 years of a late gas bill and it screwed it up for them before they got there. So, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, Philadelphians, we don't like to pay the gas bill until it's April 15th and it's about to get cut off. That's the rules. I don't know. It's like a thing. I see the folks out there. April 14th is always a line at the gas company. And uh, and the other one is October. What is it? The October 1st. Cause they cut them all off before October 15th when they can't cut them off no more. Mm -hmm. Um, here you go. So I think this is the same question that Nicole and Arlene had. Does putting someone's name on the deed prevent forfeiture to a nursing home? And please discuss how a caregiver living in the home can impact the look back period. So if there's an individual actually living in the home and who was declared that as their residence, then it only impacts the look back period for the time that person is alive. Meaning, so let's say it's Gary's house again, right? And Danielle lives with Gary and Danielle lived there with Gary, was taking care of Gary. Well, this is what happens. Gary goes into the nursing home. They can't force Danielle to move out so that they can sell the property right then. But if Gary dies in the nursing home, then the same, in the same, uh, uh, death rules apply. Either the will's going to take place and they got to probate that or intestacy is going to occur. In which case, they, in which case, now the nursing home can come in and put a lien on those assets. Now, a lot of times they don't. I'll be honest, a lot of times they don't because there's a whole bunch of, you know, it's not like our homes are worth half a million dollars here. Okay. So a lot of times they don't, but they can, which is why you want to protect yourself. Now, so the second part of that is, does putting someone's name on the deed prevent forfeiture to a nursing home? The answer is the short answer of that is yes, because it's what you own. So, but it also means that the other person may, unless it's husband and wife. So what they say on, so what is it? I never get this, it's own, it's in common. So it's in common is the good one. So tenants in common, because it doesn't make sense. It's in common, that's the good one, but by the entirety is not. Is that right, Gary? 
I always get it backwards. Yeah, tenants in common is basically That's in a white situation. If, if if you and I own a property, when one of us die, then if I die, then my portion goes to my yeah. by the entirety means, um, and it's usually with marriages. If you mm -hmm. die, then it comes to me. You know, that's essentially the two. So, but that's the problem with putting someone's deed on the uh, name on the deed. No, yeah. you still would have to in your will leave your share of the house to that person. Otherwise, me and Gary got a house together. We not married. So now I got to buy out Gary's estate when he dies. Because also that means I have to have enough money to pay whoever his heirs would be. Right. Unless he made us tenants in common, meaning as a part of his will, he left his share to me. Y'all got good questions. Come on. Because we got like five more minutes. We're actually going over because we, we talked about, you know, uh, slavery over here. So. <laughs> in the war between the states and the war in Harrisburg. I'm trying to see if I see any other questions. Yeah, well, I just want Nicole to, not only did um, Wells Fargo get, get sued, Chase was sued, and now apparently Bank of America is being sued, and they're being sued in three different jurisdictions, so it's going to be interesting. So they're being sued in Nevada and in California, and they're being sued in uh, Massachusetts um, about the SBA loan. So this is going to be interesting because, so for those of you who don't know, well, probably nobody knows besides me and Gary, California is the most liberal court in the nation. Uh, and um, <clears throat> uh, Nevada can go either way, but they specifically brought it in Vegas, and I'm sure they brought it in Vegas because that's the most liberal court in that union, okay. in this state, I'm sorry, and then Massachusetts um, can go either way. So it's it's, it's a wealthy state um, with uh, blue-leaning blue morals, but red-leaning banking policies. So that's going to be very, very interesting there to figure that out, which way that's going to go. Can married people turn their home over to their children while living? Yes, they can. So the same way. So it's um, as long. So we're married, uh, Gary and I, and we uh, and that we own the house as tenants in common. Now this is this is kind of nuanced actually, because if Gary had the house already and Danielle married him, and then I came to the house, there's an argument, and people make an argument doesn't fly off, and that Gary owned the house exclusive of me, and I'm only entitled to the appreciation of value. That's divorce law. That is not the laws of intestacy or the laws of, um, those are not estate laws. That's probate laws. Mm -hmm. And that's where people get confused with that. So a husband and wife, we would have to agree, no matter whose name was on it, to leave, to turn the house over to the kids. And any reputable um, attorney would have uh, a notarized affidavit that the other person who did not sign agreed to this and knew about it. Otherwise, you're going to throw this house back into uh, intestacy law and mm -hmm. have your intentions overwritten. And this is the reason that Gary said, theoretically, you can do all of this, but do you see why you shouldn't? Because mm -hmm. just like I said, I've been telling y'all now for three weeks, no two cases are the same. We mm -hmm. see them different every single time we see them. And so you need to make sure that you are talking to experts who can give you all of the doomsday scenarios, because that's what they are. I tell, my mother used to say all the time, she'd be like, is everything doom and gloom? And then it all works out. And I'm like, well, it's my job to tell you the worst that could happen to, to be ready. And, and Danny, I just want to add that for, for um, Ms. Brunson, too. Um, I actually suggest that to most of my clients, that if, if you're elderly or getting up there, you have children that you want to leave assets to. The best thing you could do is start passing it to them before you get sick and pass away, because the sooner you can get those assets into their hand, you avoid a lot of the inheritance and estate stuff that's going on. Um, oh, oh, also, not just that. Um, I learned this one the hard way. You can only give your kids um, twenty five thousand dollars a year tax break. Yeah, know. there's only yeah, there's only a portion. So let, let me clarify that. You, <laughs> you can, yeah, if you just deed your house to your kids, they're going to hit. They're going to get hit with a tax bill. But you can systematically give them a portion every year contractually of ownership and you mm -hmm. can start over, you know, six, seven, eight years so that they don't hit many um, tax consequences because the goal. So here's what the other people do. My neighbors, Danielle's neighbor and some of the other rich college we have, they have estate planning that is geared towards getting 
all of their estate out of their hands. So when they die, the only thing that's getting passed to their children is two insurance policies and a trust fund. But all the things that they can put their hands on, that stuff is gone, sold out of their entire estate because that's the way you want to do it. Because when you die, Uncle Sam's going to come with a bill. Now, do you want okay. that to be high or low? And if you get all the stuff out of your estate, it's going to be pretty low. And this is going to be the last question because now we're really running over. Please discuss the advantages of joint tenancy with rights of survivorship. And I think, Nicole, actually, we explained that when we, we were talking about tenancy by the entirety. So that's the joint tenancy and the rights of survivorship is whoever is living gets the property. Yeah. So just like just like if we were married. Yeah, that, I mean that that's just the benefit of, of basically making sure that whoever survives doesn't have to deal with a, a, a new owner. I mean, that's really the best way, way of explaining it to it. If if it's a marriage, if it's somebody you trust, you know, even sometimes with businesses, um, they'll have agreements that say that, you know, basically we buy insurance policy to purchase the um the the dead person's part of the business out with the insurance so that now the, the survivor can own it in full. So it's the same thing you want to do um, with your property. If you have someone who you love and you know, who you trust, who, cause again, like Daniel said, marriage is something different. There are other protections in that, but outside of marriage to the extent that you want to make sure that your property doesn't get shifted somewhere else. You want to make sure that if you want one person to have your property, when you die, make sure it is with rights of survivorship. You could do that with bank accounts too. So it's not yep. just a house. You do it with a bank account. You could do it if you own, you know, vehicle together, timeshares, anything to where, you know, two or more people own it and you want to make sure that your portion goes back, you know, to the other party. Gary, thank you so much for coming and giving us some more legal lessons for life. See, I'm seeing I can like we can get them while they're home, but that's okay because even when they go back into the office, I can still get them. Gary, I'll still come and talk to you. I'll be around for anyone that's watching. Um, feel free to uh, send Gary? me a message on Facebook. Um, as Danielle is connecting me, but I'm at 1500 Walnut Street, uh, Suite 204, Philadelphia, PA. For anyone that's out of town, the number is 267 225 5442. You can also send me a message here on Facebook at Bailey and Associates LLC, or you can send me a message on Instagram at g.b.esq. Sometimes it's actually easier to get in touch with me by sending me a message. Um, but the office is open. I'm around. Um, we're doing as much as we can to help people during this entire time. So whatever the legal issue it is, if you you know want to call Danielle, obviously you have Danielle's number if you want to talk to me. Feel free to give me a call. I specialize in personal injury or civil rights, but I also, through the firm, handle a bunch of general areas too. So whether it's family, uh, criminal defense, uh, obviously we do some wills and um, uh, power of attorneys, but essentially we're here to help you. We're, we're here to give you whatever legal advice that you need. If we can help you and in a matter of a few minutes for free, we'll do it. This is the time to be generous. So you it's can call time to help one another. Yeah, you can call the office and we'll we'll give you some help. You know, we're not looking to squeeze people's pockets right now. We want to make sure everybody's protected, everybody has peace of mind and have the information that they need. So thank you so much, Gary. Don't forget, either you need to reach me or you need even have more questions for Gary and you forgot that number. You always know that I'm here every day, Monday through Friday at 3.30. You can always hit our inbox. You know the location. Or you can give us a call at 267-291-4702, 267-291-4702. I'm so glad that everyone here is safe and healthy. Continue to be so. This is Danielle Patterson for the 190th. Don't forget, West Philly, baby. We're going to do better together.